So now we, we've seen several different methods for approximating a definite interval and for approximating the area under a curve. And there's actually a whole branch of mathematics called numerical analysis that, that is dedicated to finding approximation methods for, for a lot of things, not just integrals. And that branch is really focused, uh, among other things, on finding the error for all of these different methods that they come up with. And obviously, you can't find the exact error. If you knew the exact error, you could just add it to the approximation and you get the exact result. Um, what we can do is put an upper bound on the error. So we know what the, what the maximum possible error is going to be. Uh, given things we did, we we chose like the specific function and the the range we're integrating over and so forth. And that's what we're going to talk about uh, in this lecture. So before before we jump into these error bounds, uh, I, I want to be careful about what we mean by error. Okay, there's two kinds of errors that that we're interested in. One of them is the absolute error. The absolute error is just um, the approximate, the, excuse me, the absolute value of the approximate value minus the exact value. So that, that is truly just the magnitude. It's how far off you are. It's always positive. So we're not, we're not concerned with whether, whether you are, uh, whether you over or underestimated. Now the relative error is just the absolute error turned into a percentage. So it's going to be the absolute value of the approximate value minus the exact value divided by the exact value. Everything is always relative to that official exact quantity. All right, if you remember in, in our previous lectures, we looked at several different approximation methods. We did these two, these two Riemann sums, which are actually a flashback to first semester calculus, and the midpoint trapezoid and Simpson's rule, which, was our, which were our new methods. And what we did in all of those is we used those methods to approximate the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared dx. And so our, we're doing this on the interval from 0 to 4. And in all of these, we did it with four subintervals. And I've, I've summarized the results that we got here uh, in the results column. And then down here, I've got the exact facts. Obviously, we, we do we can integrate that function and calculate the exact value. So we have it for comparison. <clears throat> and what I did in the other two columns is I, I just calculated these two different errors, right? The absolute error, I'm looking at the left Riemann sum. This would have been just 14 minus uh, 21.333. And you get this number here. And if we divide that by 21.333, uh, you get uh, that relative error. Oh, excuse me, don't forget absolute value, right? which is why that number is positive. Okay, pretty straightforward. So what we want to be able to do now is we want to be able to say what the maximum possible error is for each of these three new methods here that we were talking about in this section. So we've got some formulas here for doing this, and, and I know there, there's a lot going on here. So remember, we've been talking about this a lot, when, when you get something like this, don't try to digest it as one big thing. Really read through it one sentence, one phrase at a time, and try to parse out what each one means and use that to kind of build up the big picture. So what do we have going on here? Well, first we're, we're doing the error, we're talking about the error bound for the midpoint and trapezoid rules because they're both very similar. And the way this works is first, we're gonna assume that the second derivative is continuous. It's just, just kind of implicitly that's saying, you know, if you want to have a bound, not saying you can't use these methods for functions that where this isn't true, but if you want to talk about the, the bound on your error, then your function has to have a continuous second derivative, which is kind of math speak for, it needs to be relatively well behaved. It needs to be relatively smooth. Uh, so then what, what do we know about this? Well, keep reading, right? And we need a, a a real number k such that the absolute value of the second derivative is less than or equal to k for every x on our interval. In other words, we need a bound. The second derivative has to have an absolute maximum on this interval that we're integrating over. Which really kind of kind of interesting. What, what this is saying is, is we we need to have some idea of the maximum 
rate of change. Remember, that's what the derivative is, right? We have to have some kind of idea of what the maximum rate of change of our function is. And if we have that, then the absolute error in approximating this integral using the midpoint and trapezoid rules with ends n sub intervals satisfies these inequalities. So let, let's look at the first one. Right, e sub m is the error from using the midpoint method. And what this inequality is saying is that that error is at most this expression here. Right, so let's kind of pick this expression apart and, and think about what's going on. Now remember, we, we want the error to be as small as possible. So we're looking to make that number as small as possible given the, the things that we've been required to work with here. So what is this saying? Well, this is saying that a large value of k is going to give us potentially a large error, where a small value of k is going to give us a, a relatively small error. Remember, k is the how fast is the our bound on how fast the function is changing. So what this is saying is, is that functions that change rapidly can potentially have a really high error, where functions that are changing slowly we're going to get a really uh, a much better approximation for. Uh, the second part here, b minus a, remember that's the length of our interval. So again, kind of trying to, trying to interpret this, this is saying that uh, we can get better results with small, we can potentially get better results with smaller intervals versus larger ones. Then you have this delta x squared part. This is really, really a key part of this for us. Remember, delta x is, is b minus a over n. So I can replace this with b minus a squared over n squared. And what makes this important is in this whole process, as the person who has been asked to find this integral, n is the only value you have any control over. You're told what function you're integrating. You're told the inter interval you have to integrate it over. The only thing you can, you can choose here is how many subintervals we have. All right, and this is actually a good thing because 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 n is in the denominator, as n increases, the bound the bound on the error decreases. All right, so th this is good news for us because this is telling me what I need to do. If I if I in order to minimize this area, I need to to use as many subintervals here as I possibly can. Okay, and then of course we've got this 24 down here, that this constant that just pops up during the derivation. If you look over here at e sub t, that's the error for the trapezoid rule. You know, it's practically identical. The only difference is that uh, constant 12 versus 24. All right, so what, what I like to do now uh, is calculate these upper bounds for the for the two scenarios that we talked about in the previous lectures. You remember what we were doing there? We were we were approximating the integral from 0 to 4 of x squared dx using four subintervals. So what, what values does this give us? Well, a is 0, b is 4, uh, like I said, n is 4, which means delta x is 4 minus 0 over 4, which is 1. All right, so that's everything we need uh, for our formula there, except k. Right, what, what are we going to do with k? Well, we need to look at the second derivative of our function. Our function is x squared, which means f prime is 2x, which means f double prime is just 2. Yes, remember, remember what k is. k is the absolute maximum of the second derivative on that interval. Well, the, this absolute, the absolute maximum is just two. So that's going to be my value of k. Remember, we, we want, could we use three? Yes. The, the second derivative is less than or equal to three. But remember, we're, we're trying to find the minimum possible bound. So I want to use the minimum possible number in there. All right, so we're going to go with two. So what does this tell us? Well, this says that the error from the midpoint method is less than or equal to two times four divided by 24 times 1 squared. All right, 2 times 4, that's 8. 8 divided by 24, that's 1 third. 
right? So this is 0 0.333 repeating. Okay, so what, what this is saying, right? I was trying to remember interpretation. What this is saying is that the maximum error we can possibly get is 0 0.3 to the third. All right, then if we repeat this over here with the trapezoid formula, this is less than or equal to, again, 2 times 4 divided by 12 this time times 1 squared. 2 times 4, that's 8. 8 divided by 12 is uh, 2 thirds, right? So that, that's uh, 0 0.666 repeating and so that is the maximum error we could get uh, for this scenario using the trapezoid method so let me put those into our table and, and let's uh, let's see what happened here so um this is the same table we had on the previous slide i've just added a column here for the errors and you can see yeah um, we actually hit lucky us uh, we hit worst case scenario uh, in both of our approximations, and our absolute error was actually equal to the maximum error. Okay, so how about Simpson's rule? Because uh, we we got a weird result here, right? We we got the exact value, so it's going to be interesting to say what to see what our error formula has to say about this, All right? So the process here really is is very similar. Right? If you look at the formula down there for the upper bound, uh, it's very similar. There, there's a different constant, and there's a different exponent. The really major difference is, is up here. Right? For Simpson's rule, we're looking at the fourth derivative, not the second. All right? And what we, we have the same constraint here. We, we need this value of k that's going to be the upper bound uh, on the absolute value of the fourth derivative. So what is that? Well, we're, we're starting off with all the same stuff here. right? E s is less than or equal to, if we're calculating this for the example that we did. Uh, let's set that k aside for just a second. B minus a was 4. This is 180. Delta k, delta x was 1, so this is 1 squared. And what about this k? Well, f of x was x squared, which means f prime was 2x. f double prime was 2, and here's where it gets interesting. The third derivative is 0 which means the fourth derivative is also zero. Because it's constant, that is the absolute maximum. So I'm going to use this for k. And when we put that in here, look at what happens. Yeah, that is zero. Excellent, because that's what we got, right? We got an error of zero. So what, what is this saying? Well, this is saying that if we're going to approximate the area under a parabola by fitting it with parabolas, which remember is what Simpson's rule does, then yeah, we're, we're going to get an exact result every time because for every parabola, that fourth derivative is going to be zero. Right, so this does raise kind of an interesting question. And we'll talk about this if you're following along in the online classroom. And we'll talk, we'll talk about this a little more in the exercises. Uh, what functions can we expect the error, uh, the error to be zero. For what functions can we expect Simpson's rule to give us an exact result, right? So that, like I said, we're not going to talk about it here. That's something we'll take up uh, in the online class exercises. So I, I finished the summary here, right? I filled in our new value, uh, our, our final error, upper bound. Uh, and again, like, like I said, that does give us uh, what, when, when you stop and think about it, that does give us what it really is, the expected result there. Okay, so this wraps up our discussion of uh, integration methods. We, we've talked about quite a few at this point, right? We've, we've got U substitutions, we've got uh, integration by parts, uh, the partial fractions decomposition for when you're working with rational expressions. We've got uh, all sorts of different things we can do with trigonometric integrals and trig substitutions, and then push comes to shove, well, we've got these approximation methods. So in the next uh, chapter, in the next big sequence of lectures, uh, we're going to kind of kind of change directions a little bit and look at some examples of, of practical things that you can do uh, with integration.